Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that often starts with the Carnivore Cures meat only elimination diet. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Belinda Fecky. She is the wife of Dr. Gary Fecky and ever since her husband was put on trial for recommending nutritional guidance to his patients, she started advocating for why was he even in trouble. She's learned a lot about the alliances and the hush-hush agreements that many different conglomerates and corporations and even churches work together in order to decide what our societies are going to eat. It's quite troublesome to see all the relationships that Belinda has uncovered. Belinda describes herself as a health disruptor and change agent, challenging the health benefit claims of the last 50 years of low-fat, high-carb messaging. She's been researching the vested interests and religious ideology shaping our plant-based dietary and health guidelines since 2014. She is concerned about dietary dogma that negatively impacts health outcomes and attempts to silence healthcare professionals from discussing evolutionary science. Belinda founded supportgary.com in August 2017 as a way of sharing her research and was invited to her very first Low Carb Down Under event that year. Belinda has done her research and you will see in our conversation all the different things that she has uncovered. It's quite fascinating. Let's get right into the show. Hi, Belinda. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm a big fan of you and Dr. Gary Fecky, and I just wanted to have you on and talk about all things nutrition and a lot of the things that are kind of going on behind scenes that you know so much about. So for the people that are listening and watching, if you can introduce yourself. Thanks so much for having me, Judy. And yes, my name is Belinda Fecky. Um, I'm the wife of um, silenced uh, orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Gary Fecky, who was, became the only medical doctor in the world silence from talking about nutrition, even reducing sugar to his patients in 2016 after a two and a half year star chamber investigation. And we had to fight for another two years to get his name cleared. And in the end, all charges, all all trumped up charges were dropped and he was fully exonerated and even received a written apology from the medical board here in, in Australia. But the crazy thing was I'm a professional photographer by trade and a nurse in my past life. And so I'm very used to being behind the scenes. I take photos of people. I tell other people's stories. And when I was watching Gary and these other doctors start to get absolutely hammered for talking about reducing sugar and, and the health benefits of low carbohydrate diets and, and then looking into this, I was seeing they're talking about the science and I'm watching these guys, these women, talking so incredibly and seeing such incredible health benefits and such changes in their patients and the people and their clients that they're seeing. And I said to Gary, I don't think this is about the science. I think the reason you guys are in trouble, I think the reason there's so much pushback is something much deeper and much bigger. And so I went from a photographer behind a camera, staying out of sight to having to not just stand beside Gary, but take a step in front Mm. and actually go, I've got to be loud here. I've got to use my voice to give him his back. And that's, I guess, was a huge change for me, a a really big step. And I often say, the more you have to lose, the braver you become. And that's certainly the fight that Gary and I personally had, Um, him as an individual, as an orthopedic surgeon, trying to promote nutrition in a way that would improve his patient's health outcomes. And for me, trying to defend my husband so that he was able to practice the medicine that he wanted to practice. And so we became a united front and hopefully standing on the shoulders of giants allowed others to take this message forward without the fear of losing their medical license here in Australia in particular. And so it became a, a very big thing for both of us. And in my research, which I decided I needed to start doing to find out why on earth this message was being silenced, I came to understand that the medical board here in Tasmania 
had a, an expert witness on their side who was determining whether Gary could talk about nutrition. And even though he's an orthopedic surgeon, he still did all the basic um, medical degree along with everybody else. So he had extra information that he'd learned along the way, but there was nothing in his basic medication or uh, basic medical training or any other doctor's medical training that he wasn't aware of. And it's interesting when you look back, the first couple of years of medical and I would imagine dietetic training and lots of other areas really talk about anatomy and physiology. They would talk about biochemistry and all of those really important things. And then the next three to four years, all you learn how to do is to band-aid sick care. Right. They, they just funnel it into medicating and surgical training and, and people forget. They, they suddenly think this is the only way we can save people. They completely forget about all of that basic information and they're not even really it's not even really reiterated that nutrition is part of that basic understanding of how our body works when i went to look at who this expert witness was for the medical board and i thought i had very much cognitive dissonance and i was determined to find that he was working for the sugar industry because that's that's the only possible ex explanation because that's all gary was talking about when he got reported he was requesting that his patient in hospital or recommending to them that they reduce their sugar because they'd gone in with uncontrolled blood glucose levels and they're eating the diabetic diet in the hospital included three desserts per day and gary was just watching this person with a diabetic foot complication uh, an ulceration that wouldn't heal on a glucose level that was just like a roller coaster it was ridiculous and the dietitian at the hospital reported him to the medical board to say, you know, reducing sugar isn't part of the, the dietary guidelines and um, he was acting outside of his professional scope. I think this guy must work for the sugar industry. Unfortunately, he didn't, but it made complete sense when I realised he worked for the cereal industry. Mm. When I found some documents online, like I was, I was really set into working out all of this research. I just had to get to the bottom of it and I spent years. In fact, I've continued. So I'm up to eight years now. I think we're just delving into the vested interests that are shaping our dietary guidelines and understanding that these documents that I uncovered in, I think, 2017, that's how we were able to get Gary's name cleared in the end, were actually by the Australian Breakfast Cereal Manufacturers Forum. It was a conglomerate of four major cereal companies here. It was Kellogg's, Sanitarium, Freedom Foods and Nestle. And they were meeting each month to get together to determine marketing strategies and different things but some documents that got either got leaked or somehow got onto the internet because i don't know how to hack into anything these documents were there and they actually had gary's name targeted for active defense i just kept oh, what <laughs> what are, what does this even mean so then uncovering some more of their documents really looking into the abcmf i found that their serial sales were down they were blaming low carb advocates. The ABCMF was partnering with the Dietitians Association of Australia and for a mere $23,000 a year, the Dietitians Association of Australia were to use their members to influence, protect and actively defend cereal grains and even sugars messaging. Wow. I mean, if Gary and I had realized it was only $23,000 a year, we could have done a crowdfunder and said, hey, let's talk the Dietitians Association and talk about low carb instead. We would have got 50,000 for them. Yeah. You know, this is really scary because I don't think a lot of dietitians understand that their parent body, right. who not only regulates them and accredits them, but educates them, was in bed with the food industry, not just cereal, but certainly this, these documents, highlighted the cereal industry influence. And I spoke to a couple of dietitians after I uncovered even more information. I, in fact, I looked into their vegetarian position paper and discovered that all four of their references, the only four references were by Sanitarium Health Food Company, which produces cereals and Kellogg's. And I said to these dietitians, did you realize that this is the only references they're using is by industry? And they said they had no idea because you trust your parent body. You know, as a doctor, as a dietitian, you would trust the bodies that are providing education. And I guess that made us start to really question everything. And it's not only the food industry, but the pharmaceutical industry that have really been manipulating and shaping dietary and health guidelines 
for a very, very long time. So my history as a photographer came out and just went, uh, uh, when Cyril Fabrecki came after my husband, the mama bear came out. You know, I just had to work out what this was all about. And hopefully, I mean, we're not the only people speaking about reducing sugar and low carbohydrate, and it goes right back, you know, back to the 1920s even, with Russell Wilder talking about the health benefits of low carb for managing not only diabetes, well, sorry, not only um, epilepsy, but even before that, he was talking about managing it for diabetes. So this messaging keeps getting dampened down and pushed back and pushed back instead of being highlighted as something that's really it is achievable and it is sustainable for those who choose to do it so it needs i guess where we're going from now that gary has been exonerated is trying to get these tools into the guidelines into health guidelines dietitian or dietary guidelines and um, also diabetes guidelines and it doesn't have to be the only way and no one size fits all but it should be there as an option for people who want to choose to reduce carbohydrates, there's a therapeutic carbohydrate reduction, which is what Russell Wilder was speaking about in 1922. Right through, it's still being talked about now, Adele Height created some amazing resources and it's on the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioner website that anyone can access and there's different levels for public and for health professionals. So this information is out there. We need to work out how to get it into guidelines so that people can access it if they choose to. When Dr. Fetke first got, I guess, maybe the letter, what did yes. he initially think was the issue? I guess when he first received the notification, it said that he was in trouble because he recommended his patient reduce sugar. So we knew it was about sugar right, right. from the outset. Okay. Um, he thought it was a power play mm. thing within the hospital because I, I can't tell you how excited my husband was when he worked out that sugar and reducing carbohydrates could improve people's health. Like he was, it, it brought joy back to medicine. It made him so happy to be able to offer something to help improve people. As an orthopedic surgeon, he was seeing end stage complications and he was amputating. So let's go back 20 years ago when he was first became an orthopedic surgeon at 25, not like 30 years now, he would see someone with a diabetes foot complication maybe once or twice a year that required some sort of amputating. And by 2014, certainly by 2016, he was seeing someone every single week in his orthopedic clinic in Northern Tasmania, which is a catchment area of about 120,000 people. So it's not very big every week wow. that was requiring some sort of debridement or even an amputation of a toe, a forefoot, a whole foot, and sometimes even a lower leg. And, and as he said, you can never get that sound out of your head. If you cut someone's lower leg off, knowing you're maiming someone really, right. and it drops into a steel bucket, it's the most chilling sound you can possibly hear in a, in a surgery. And he was just, he wasn't having nightmares, but he was just getting so distressed about it. And the people who have got um, diabetic foot complications, they're in hospital for months and months, if not years sometimes, because you simply cannot stop this ulceration from right. going on. You're you forever having to um, do dressings on it all the time. And as Gary said, it, it actually smells. Uh, he could imagine if you go into a leper colony back in the days when they had them, and it was a lot of rotting flesh. He said, sometimes if you've got a medical ward with six or seven people in there with rotting flesh, it, it doesn't smell good. And these people are embarrassed, you know, besides the fact that they're in pain, they're potentially losing parts of their body to a, a disease that could be reversed or put into remission by food. How can you not offer it to people? How can you not help them heal and get better? And so he went to the dietetics department at the hospital when he first started to work out about sugar or reading about it. And he was so excited. And he said, Let, what can we do? Can we do a study? Can we do something about this? And I don't know if the dietetics department weren't interested at all because it wasn't part of their guidelines. Their parent body was very anti reducing sugar and carbohydrates because of, I would say, their funding and their education saying that it wasn't a problem. But 
or did they just not want Gary to be the first one to talk about it? Mm. You know, were, was the dietitian department just wanting to silence him because he was sort of talking about something that should have been their specialty? I couldn't work it out at the time. And I think that's what Gary thought. It was more, much more of a power play within the hospital. He had no idea that he was stepping on toes, I'd say nationwide, if not globally. He just didn't realise at the time. And as I did more and more research, I realised it wasn't just the sugar and the carbohydrates you know, going against the grain. He wasn't just going against the grain. He was actually talking about including animal fats and proteins in the diet to heal because a low fat diet, you, you need animal proteins to start to heal those diabetic uh, ulcerations. It, it, it's the only thing that will start to improve them. Certainly reducing sugar is a start, but to heal and to grow new flesh and to you know, make those big changes, um, he believes animal proteins and fats are the key. And I thought it was he was only in trouble for talking about the low carb side, but then I started to come to realize it was also the animal proteins and fats. And Gary and I worked on a bit of a diagram together and a concept around nutrition science. And if you think about it, you need, so on the nutrition science side, you need essential proteins, essential okay. fatty acids, essential vitamins and minerals, and you can use non-essential carbohydrates as fuel, but you don't actually need them because our bodies can make all the glucose that we need. So that's the science side. And then you've got the non-science side and it's highly influential and far more than we ever realized. And the non-essential sides are um, ethical and religious beliefs, which I'm not dismissing as in very important to people, but you don't need them. They're not essential for everybody. You know, everyone has their own ethical or religious beliefs that could influence. Um, and the other thing is vested interests. And this is the food and pharmaceutical industries and also religious ideology, which I didn't understand how much that was potentially shaping um, the plant-based dietary guidelines that we're sort of looking at developing. If you have a look at the, the changes in the graphics from the 1930s even, right through to today's graphics in America in particular, the my plate doesn't even mention the word meat anymore. It's only got protein on it. And mm -hmm. so then when you look at the protein space and it talks about legumes and all sorts of other things in there, but it's also, it's almost um, doubling up on those plant-based proteins because you can also have them in the vegetable section. So this whole push and you think, well, where did the meat go on these dietary guidelines? In Australia, Gary said you have to send out a search and rescue party to try and find the red meat and dairy in ours. But processed foods, you know, especially the grains, the breads, the pastas, the, all of those things, they're literally shotgunned all over ours. Ours is a very pretty picture with a million, million graphics. Yours is a very centralised plate with like four yeah. sections. So, you know, this is crazy. Ours even allows um, all the vegetable and seed oils, but a whole area really with discretionary foods is pictured on our on our graphics. So you can see cakes and you can see chocolate and you can see why is it even there? People would understand you can have discretionary foods because they're in the supermarkets and they're all around, but to have it highlighted on a dietary guideline that says eat for health, I think makes it a very confusing messaging for people. Yeah, during the pandemic, I saw a graphic made from, I think it was the like the Middle East, the that part of the World Health Organization, they created a food recommendation list because there wasn't really much out from the World Health Organization. And it says limit saturated fats. It's all the ones that we always hear, limit saturated fats, red meats, and then have an abundance of like canola oil and other seed oils that aren't ideal. But, you know, going back to everything you're saying, what is it that is, why are they demonizing animal-based products so much and then really wanting us to go even more plant-based than we essentially are eating so much corn and soy. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with food subsidies and right. how you can produce so much corn and soy so cheaply. Um, so it makes sense then to incorporate that as a, as a cheap food source. But a lot of my research has really looked at um, how the vested interests 
and in particular Coca-Cola, which is a, which I believe is a huge influencer in dietary guidelines and health guidelines. Um, the vice president for Coca-Cola, a, a guy called Alex Malaspina, started the International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI, in 1978. And this group includes everything from um, food industries to chemical industries, and it's got Monsanto. Monsanto and Bayer and all of those things on there as well, but it's the it's Pfizer and Sanofi, so all the pharmaceutical industries. It started out with tobacco, but the tobacco industry then started to hide itself under craft and other food industries that they also bought, so they wouldn't seem so obviously tobacco. But Coca Cola instigated that, and and Coca Cola, it was hugely instrumental in um, the Nutrition Foundation in America to begin with. And their um, nutrition reviews magazine that they produced then became part of the Ilsey. It's so Ilsey now print it. And this is, I would say, hugely influenced by food and pharmaceutical industries. And they are producing information for health professionals worldwide that subscribe to the Ilsey and, and these nutrition reviews. So if you look at Coca Cola, and I would say that covers it really covers a lot of the food industry. Their intent, their public health messaging is to minimise the harms of sugar. And then I've come across the religious ideology that I believe is hugely influencing uh, food and dietary guidelines and, and policy in all sorts of ways. And that's coming from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And their intent on promoting a biblical Garden of Eden diet, which is fruit, nuts, and seeds. And somehow these two have come together to create like a bit of a symbiotic relationship. And both of them, by minimizing the harms of sugar and promoting the Garden of Eden diet, they both want to demonize animal proteins and fats. It suits both parties okay. to do that, which then allows them to promote a plant-based diet. And, it, and so you've got the industry, which has got conflicts of interest, and you've got a religion that has no conflicts of interest. It's, it's got a purpose. Mm -hmm. And these two are very, very powerful allies that have been working together since the 1940s. And it makes no sense if you think about them as separate entities. I can't understand why they're working together. So it must just be that they really do want to work together because their, their purpose becomes highlighted in the final messaging, I guess. And so I'm, I'm not anti-vegan, I'm not anti-vegetarian, I'm not anti-religion. I think everyone has the right to their own beliefs and to be supported. In fact, Gary and I opened a nutrition clinic in 2014 and we supported everybody, no matter what um, their belief or their food preferences were. And I think that's really important going forward for people because not everyone can eat a certain way and not everyone wants to eat meat. Right. But for the what I'm seeing with these guidelines that are being created by these two very powerful groups is the demonization of animal proteins and fats. And that choice to eat those things is being taken away by these guidelines that are being shaped and understanding that the dietary guidelines influence. You know, some people think, oh, my dietary guidelines don't matter to me. I walk into a supermarket or I walk to the markets and I buy what I want to buy. But they are hugely influential in medical and dietetic education school education, school lunch programs, what's fed in hospitals, what's fed in aged care and childcare and prisons and military. Like they do have a, a deep extending arm into all of these areas. And the current White House conference on is it hunger, nutrition and health coming up on Wednesday, that's going to try and make the dietary guidelines extend even further in really deeply into medical education. And I'm very, very concerned for, I guess, this embedding of a plant-based ideology into the fabric of American society. The more I look at it, the more I go, wow, and unfortunately, we follow you. So this is why I'm so interested in doing research into this area, um, because it will affect what happens here in Australia as well. And understanding the global influence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Diet, what? which was a title of a research paper that was put out by devout Seventh-day Adventists. So I didn't make that title up. You know, understanding their global influence 
is massive. And you can look that up. I think it was um, published in 2017. They state in this paper that they believe nutrition science began with the advent of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863 from visions that were given to their prophetess about health and food from, you know, she claimed they were given to her by God. And some people say, well, how does a little church really affect me? But they are one of the biggest healthcare providers in America. They have something like 84 hospitals based across America and a lot of clinics and other things, but they also have educational facilities. They train people in medicine and dietetics. And one of the founders of the American Dietetic Association was actually trained at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, which was originally owned by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and under John Harvey Kellogg. And so this push, she took that into the American Dietetic Association in 1917, and she trained 500 dietitians herself personally in this promoting a plant-based diet. And she wrote the textbooks for over 30 years for dietetics. So it goes right back in history. And this push has come further and further, and as I say, really cemented in the 1940s. Um, when Mervyn Harding from the College of Medical Evangelists went and did his PhD thesis under Frederick Stair at the Harvard School of Public Health. And this is when the vegan, imagine Fred Stair's utmost joy and surprise when someone who has no commercial vested interests comes and says, I want to prove that vegetarianism is healthy. And he's being paid by the food industry to um, promote cereals and grains. And you think, wow, he must have just gone, thank you very much. And they started publishing their papers in the early 1950s, presenting at Congress. And, you know, this messaging has just grown from there. And this collaboration between, it's now called Loma Linda University and Harvard University has cemented in many, many ways and is very strong right now. I have so many questions, but- um, I know, I'm sorry. (laughs) I I, I jump around so much. No, no, it's good. That history is so powerful. I guess I just didn't know a lot about that history. I think the question I have, and maybe it's because Coca-Cola owns so much more of the food industry that I'm aware of, but yes, I would think that if I could just, why couldn't Coca-Cola be part of a meal that has a hamburger in it? And it, maybe it's because they own other parts. And so they want you to eat the plant-based burger. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And then in terms of if the seventh day reads the Bible, for example, there are so many stories where in celebration, they kill the fattest animal and they celebrate with that so are they picking and choosing religion and I just don't know enough so just curious your yeah. thoughts it, it's it's a really interesting conversation I think if you go back to the 1800s okay the temperance health reform movement was starting in America in the 1800s it came from England Sweden Borgism and a guy called William Metcalf came to America to start the Bible Christian church okay and he was a big believer following on you know, right back to Pythagoras and all sorts of things. He'd heard little bits about, I suppose, Christian ascetism and spiritual purity was not eating an animal that could be animalistic. Okay. You know, the whole beliefs around the 1800s, it was a big revivalistic movement and they wanted to talk about calming and spiritual ascetism and they believed in the early 1800s that taking animal or taking flesh meat out of the diet would make people more spiritual. And and a big belief was that spiritual purity was defiled by masturbation. So it was it was a really big concern back then apparently. And I spoke to James Connolly recently. He worked on Sacred Cow with Diana Rogers. Oh, right. And he was saying to me, maybe they were looking at people in the prison system and in the hospitals who were considered um, insane and and create you know really criminal types people with epilepsy it looked at all sorts of people who were in these systems and because they had nothing else to do maybe they were masturbating and then they turned that around and said that was the cause of their insanity and that was the cause of their criminal behavior just trying to think you know how did this become such a huge association with meat and masturbating and insanity and crime so It came from then and Sylvester Graham, you may have heard of Graham crackers. So Sylvester Graham, Caleb Jackson, there was a lot of people in this temperance health reform movement before the Seventh-day Adventist church was formed, but it led into that. And while these people were, so Sylvester Graham was preaching on corners of the street, telling people they should be eating a bland diet and getting rid of all these animalistic thoughts. 
So in 1863, Ellen G. White, well, that was the year that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded, and she claimed that God was telling her that flesh meat was a toxic stimulant and it was more harmful than alcohol or tobacco, you know, all of these things. And so she took this temperance health reform belief to a church doctrine and it became you know, this thing. I would say that they were all pushing towards a vegan diet, but in the 1800s, they didn't have the supplementation. They couldn't take all of the animal products out of the diet. And that goes all the way back to Pythagoras and the beginning of vegetarianism because vitamin B12 is an essential nutrient and it can only be found in animal proteins and fats. So while they were pushing towards getting rid of all animal products out of the diet, taking flesh meat out, they could do and still eat eggs and still have milk and still have cream and cheese and butter. So it was a vegetarian diet, but they were pushing and they wanted to get further Veganism wasn't coined until 1944, and that's because by then they'd created supplementation, they'd fortified, they were doing all these things. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was only 12 years old when he went to work for the first family of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when he went to work with Ellen G. White and her husband, James, and he was tasked with typesetting their, well, I would say her sermons. She calls them testimonies to the church. They were the visions that she was getting. She claimed to have received over 2,000 visions and dreams from God in her lifetime. And so she was writing books. I think she had 49 books in her lifetime. She's the most translated author in America of either gender. Wow. Like, people don't even understand how huge her writings are. They go globally, but this is someone who's very, very influ influential who most people have never heard of. Right. <clears throat> and the book that he first typeset was called A Solemn Appeal to Mothers or A Solemn Appeal. And it spoke only of mothers deterring their children from masturbating. And he was 12. He was typesetting things that you know, were saying things like, it was as if you put a pistol to your chest and took your life instantly. Your head decays inwardly. You become criminal. You become insane. You get epilepsy. You, know, you lose your eyesight. Well, hasn't everyone heard masturbating makes you go blind? I mean, even I've vaguely heard of that. She said all of these things in this book. And he worked and typeset for them for four years. They then paid for him to become a doctor. They paid for his wow. medical education. So when he came back to work at their Western Health Reform Institute in the 1870s, and then he became the superintendent, he changed it to the Battle Creek Sanitarium and he grew it from a place that had maybe 40 people coming to the, the sanatoriums where they used to sit out and have sun, like a lot of their beliefs, a lot of their thoughts around health make a lot of sense and we're being talked about that by these temperance health reformers again you know sunshine rest sleep fresh air all, all of those bits water cures were very big back then but john harvey kellogg determined that maybe this defiling of people and to get become totally spiritual you had to have a clean colon so he took it even further than anti-flesh meat he he organized people to have enemas all the time and just you know eat highly sorry very high fiber foods so that everything would just go through so you wouldn't have any sensations down below to irritate to potentially then make you want to masturbate and and this was honestly the the belief and the and the basis of this dietary reform which i think comes as a surprise to a lot of people in fact i've seen a, a heading that um kellogg's cornflakes were part of an anti-masturbation crusade and you know people will think oh wow but it grabs your attention and when you look back it actually that's the True. truth so right. um it's a fascinating history as to where that came from and william keith kellogg john harvey kellogg's brother was his accountant and and did a lot of work with him john harvey kellogg married and his wife was had come from a home economics Ella Eaton Kellogg, she became, came from a home economics sort of background. And I don't know if you did it at school, but we actually had a class called home economics. But in home economics, we learned to cook and sew. Right. <laughs> we didn't learn economics. Home economics started as an economic consideration of the cost of food. And, and so she brought that area in and she created the dietetic education. I believe she was one of the founders of dietetics with John Harvey Kellogg but they also created a science in the kitchen and started doing experiments on how can they create foods that could take the place of flesh meat, milk, 
eggs and butter. And that was their, that was their whole, I guess, you know, their purpose in life. And William Keith just said to him, because all these cereal companies were all going off on the back of their inventions into flaked wheat and flaked corn. And William Keith said, we can make a lot of money from this. We need to add sugar. But John Harvey Kellogg was a very devout Adventist and very devout in his beliefs and truly believed when Ellen G. White actually said, you know, we shouldn't have a lot of sugar. So, and he didn't want to commercialize it. So they split off and William Keith created the cereal empire we all know today as a very devout Adventist as well. But John Harvey Kellogg went on then to just keep experimenting to create um, alternative meats, alternative nut butters, you know, all of those things. He held 30 plus patents for foods and food processes by the time he died. What would you say are some of the, I guess, the significant financial conflicts of interest today? I mean, I know that there's the Kellogg company, so the cereal, and then there's a a religious arm, but how does it play out today? It's massive. (laughs) Um, If you, Nina Teichos has just been um, tweeting about a nutrient labeling profile that's been developed by Tufts. Oh my gosh. University. (laughs) Yes. And when you look at that, the limitations, I suppose Ty Beal and Frederick Leroy and a few others have shown a graphic when they've studied it and shown that if you tweak those um, algorithms, you can potentially make it look like Lucky Charms and other cere- Cereal. sugary cereals yes. look healthier than eggs and ground beef is at the bottom. Right, right. And this is that whole thing about, you know, we're going to minimise the harms of sugar, we're going to promote the Garden of Eden diet and that together demonizes animal proteins and fats. If you look at all of these nutrient profiling systems, they are heavily swayed against any animal protein or fat, and you get points for anything that's cereals, grains, and low fat. And as I said, I've alluded to over and over, this is, it's based in the 1800s, it's come through and it's consolidated in the 1900s, and we're feeling the ramifications of it in the 22nd century, 23rd century, but you do, this is where it's come from. And you have to understand that it's the food industry, it's the pharmaceutical industry that want to band-aid sick care. I've looked into Novo Nordisk extensively because they're so involved in the uh, concept and talk about around obesity and you know not making people feel ashamed of their weight and things. But if you look at their marketing, they are trying very hard to push for obesity to be classified as a disease because they can only go so far with their diabetes medications, with their insulin, which is sure. where they started. They started out as an insulin company. If they can get um, the governments around the world, and especially they're pushing here in Australia, and I imagine in America, to classify obesity as a disease, they are going to have the most massive windfall you could ever imagine because of the drugs that they've developed oh, to man. suppress appetites. So they all work together. You know, Once you start having hyperpalatable processed foods, that drive hunger, sugar drives hunger, and all this carbohydrate that we're told to eat, you base your diet on six to 11 serves of carbohydrates per day and you work up from there. And if you include meat, good, but they're really pushing not just a a demonization of animal proteins and fats for our health, but planetary health as well. So they're starting to make a lot of people, especially I would say younger people, consider reducing their meat intake for the planet. So then it becomes this ethical belief, yes. which is very powerful. It just allows the food industry to produce more and more processed crap and for then um, the pharmaceutical industry to band-aid the sick care that we develop from all of this. So I don't believe a lot of these things were invented to be bad in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, in 1911, you had like the metabolic storm of Crisco, which was developed by Procter & Gamble. Right because their um, candles were becoming obsolete after the invention of electricity. So, you know, they found out they could harden cottonseed oil through uh, partially hydrogenating them into a, like, it looked like a trans fat. They were doing that for their soaps. The cottonseed oil was for the soap. Once they produced that soap and they individually wrapped it, they went, it actually looks a lot like lard. And animal fats were really expensive around the late 1800s. So then they were going, well, maybe we can use our hydrogenated cottonseed oil that we're using and selling as soap. Maybe we can change it up and sell it for um, Crisco. So this is where it came. So in 1911, you had Crisco launched as a, as a product and 
especially marketed to people who are of Jewish faith because like the Seventh-day Adventists, sorry, I didn't answer that in your first question, they look very closely at the First Testament of the Bible and the laws of Le Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And the Seventh-day Adventist church go even further back and they believe that the Garden of Eden diet was the biblical Garden of Eden diet chosen for us by our creator. Until we go back to that diet, we can't possibly go back to heaven. You know, our salvation is getting rid of flesh meat out of our diet, the desire for it, because otherwise we're not fit for heaven. Oh, right. So this is where their belief comes from, all the way back to the biblical Garden of Eden diet, whereas the Jewish faith and Islam came further with um, Moses writing the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, talking more about the slaughter process of the animals, but clean and unclean foods. And pork was demonized. Right. You know. And so when I consider this demonization of processed meats, a lot of those are pork. And a lot of that demonization has come from the Seventh-day Adventist church because they consider pork an unclean meat. So, you know, again, it's, it's such a complex history, but you go back and you look at, you know, the earliest drying and salting of meats, it, a lot of it was pork because it was so easy. It was such a fatty right. meat. It stored well and you could transport it and things. So this demonization of something that if you look right back into before Christ, you know, these meats were being eaten, cured and stored and dried, that it, it doesn't make any sense to demonize them now unless the processing oxidizes the, the fats. And that, yeah, that oxidization is what happened with Crisco. So again, 1911, you had Crisco, you had cornflakes, <laughs> you had the cereal industry, you had John Harvey Kellogg producing his alternative meats. So soy was starting to get mm -hmm. into the system and you had Coca-Cola just taking off. Coca-Cola was produced in the mid 1800s by a guy called Pemberton who was trying to find uh, an alternative to his morphine that he was addicted to from being injured in the Civil War. Mm. And so he came across this, he was a chemist and a doctor, and he created um, Pemberton's French wine cocoa, which was meant to be a great nerve tonic and got rid of headaches and all sorts of other things, dyspepsia. And then the prohibition laws started to come about, were being talked about, and they were starting to put excessive costs on the licenses for alcoholic drinks. So that's when Pemberton created this really sugary, syrupy cocaine mixture that could be added to soda water. But in 1911, that was the height of the metabolic disease, the, the storm, which Gary calls it, <laughs> metabolic storm, was the trans fats, the cereals, soys, alternative meats, and Coca-Cola, just bang, right then, 1911. We've suffered ever since. Yeah. And then like not that much later, Rockefeller with the, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a big history buff, but I know that Rockefeller then with the pharmaceutical company then bought in all the petroleum medications in the, I think it was the forties or fifties. So it was just. 1910. Oh, was it 1910 with even that? Yeah. So just... probably 1911 was even more. 1910 Rockefeller and Carnegie commissioned a Flexner report. Right, right. And that's when they started to work out how they could get rid of a lot of the educational facilities that were homeopathic, that right. were, you know, essentially telling people, you know, it's really important to get fresh air and sunshine and all these other things, the water cures and things, and we needed to change to um, medicate and operate. That was the time when they started to investigate, 1910. And that I looked into it specifically because I was thinking, how did the College of Medical Evangelists, <laughs> which became Loma Linda University, how did they survive that? And they had to compromise their education to start to include pharmaceuticals to stay registered, to allow them to be educating doctors that fell into line with the American Medical Association, which got hijacked by Rockefeller and Carnegie. So exactly, it was all around that time. And you're thinking this is 110 years ago and we're feeling the ramifications of all of that now. So I looked into the whole Tufts Compass because it came out and, you know, there was a lot of yes. noise around it and it was in all the corporate media press. And I did a really long research paper on it because it didn't make sense. And I saw also that ground beef was really low. So I think it was mm -hmm. if you ate lean meats, but you added seed oil, the ranking would go up versus if you had yes. the lean meats and added butter, it would go down. And, yes. and then the ratings made no sense. So they would let 
I think they had certain criteria that if the, an apple didn't fit in, they wouldn't knock the apple for having missing some fat soluble vitamins, <laughs> but for meats, they would knock it. And it's just the comparison was not fair. And, and you're right. Like even with obviously meats don't have much fiber, but then that was a criteria. So I just made the point of, you have to know what food you're specifically talking about to then make judgments. But uh, absolutely. One mm. interesting thing I saw was that Darius, who's one of the main, I think he was a mm-hmm. senior writer, all of his funding, I think uh, Dannon was one. So a big cereal yogurt person. So yep. that's why dairy was kind of higher up in the rankings. Mm-hmm. Um, fish was kind of relatively higher up. And in previous studies, he got funding from And I'm a big fan of fish, but he got funding from omega-3 companies and, and it's just, Mm -hmm. and cereal was super high on that. So I, I see that. And even during the pandemic, even though, even if you don't understand a lot of this history, what was very interesting was all of the top notch hospitals, not one of them ever during the pandemic came out with a, here's what you should do if you have COVID right, of Mm -hmm. some type of supplementation or help you feel better. There was no literature that came out from them of here's what you should do before you go to the hospital or when you get COVID. Yep. And that was really weird, right? So really, really weird. It was, I think going back to that conversation about fish. Yes. The temperance health reformers believed that warm blooded animals created all those issues. Fish Mm -hmm. is cold blooded. Oh, okay. Okay. There you so, go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, it, it's, it, it makes sense when you start to think mm-hmm. about this. And I didn't realize in a lot of my research that I've been doing that Catholicism before Henry VIII broke away from it and um, joined and created the Church of England, there was so many fish fasts that were growing on the Roman Catholic calendar in the, eight, in the 1500s. And he just went, I'm getting so over fish. <laughs> So not only did he want to marry Anne Boylan and, and divorce Catherine of Aragon, the Pope, which the Pope wouldn't allow at the time, but he, he was apparently very, very sick of the fish fasts that were pretty much taking up the majority of the calendar. And so when he broke away and created the Church of England, there were no fish fasts in, in um, oh, so the Anglican Church. But there was a guy in um, Cincinnati, which is a very high catholic population okay and he was a an owner of mcdonald's franchise and he realized he was just really struggling on fridays fish fridays in the 1960s to get customers in so he was the one who invented the fillet of fish oh okay makes sense you you start to you just go this just all starts to make sense when you look at all of these different things that have happened and and you understand where it's coming from as a you know, it's something that's potentially just ingrained. You know, we think about saturated fat and common sense tells you it's bad. Right. No, right. it isn't. Right. But, you know, that's the feeling. If you talk to people in the community, they've been educated subliminally or professionally. And this is the messaging you're getting from the 1977 dietary goals from the first White House Conference on Nutrition and the Senate Select Committee creating those dietary goals and subsequently the dietary guidelines. It, the big push then was demonizing saturated fats. Right. And yes, we can talk about the the influences on that group. And I believe it was heavily food industry, specifically sugar and specifically the Seventh-day Adventist church's dietary beliefs through Nathan Pritikin. So Nathan Pritikin was an adjunct professor at the Loma Linda University. Well, I can't say that he was actually ever baptized into the church, he was very, very much a big believer in their dietary health reform. And he loved Ellen White. So I've seen writings where he's talked about her. So he was a very close friend of Senator George McGovern. McGovern actually did his eulogy. So he had Nathan Pritikin and potentially Hans Deal and the College of Medical Evangelists, Loma Linda University, really saying, you know, vegetarianism is a really important thing. He had Fred Stair from Harvard coming through with all of his sugar industry funding that was found from Kristen Cairns, I think in, was that 19, was that um, 2017 around then? I think she uncovered a whole lot of documents stating that Frederick Stair and the Harvard School of Public Health had been hugely funded by the sugar industry. And then Nick Motton, who wrote the Dietary Goals, he was a vegetarian and I've heard 
references or I've read references that potentially he was a Seventh-day Adventist, creating this demonization of saturated fat. And now with this new White House conference on nutrition, only the second one, I'm very, very fearful. They're not only demonizing saturated fat, but animal protein as well. And as you say, from looking at that compass right. nutrient profiling system, it's really becoming very clear. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine was founded at the Loma Linda University in 2003 as the Christian Association of Lifestyle Medicine. In 2004, they renamed it because it probably wasn't gaining traction beyond Loma Linda University to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It has grown incredibly and I would say significantly after they, after Coca-Cola executives join or people who are very involved in Coca-Cola joined the board in 2009, 2010. And the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is one of the invited people to this White House Conference on Nutrition. Like so many people can't get in, like it's amazing. It's such a, a tight knit group, but the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's president is in. And I haven't found anything to say that she's a Seventh-day Adventist, but the majority of their presidents passed and certainly the founding members and everyone were devout Seventh-day Adventists. The resources on their website and, and part of this college uh, have been written by either devout Seventh-day Adventists or people involved with Coca-Cola, exercises medicine. And I believe they're trying to create this idea that you write prescriptions for eat, sorry, move more, eat less meat. Now, this is their whole determination. They are already involved in so many medical education in America, and they're pushing for it to be medical education here in Australia as well. But they have recently written, I think it was only on Friday, I, like, I had a panic on the weekend. I went, oh my gosh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine have claimed they're going to donate $24 million worth of education to 100,000 physicians as part of their commitment to the White House Conference. But if you look at it, they're offering 100,000 physicians who've potentially never heard of Ellen G. White, <laughs> um, no idea that Coca-Cola is so involved in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and they're offering them five and a half hours of free resource. That's nothing. Right. Okay, that might be how much they'd make if they charged somebody else to do it. But these resources are already prepackaged on their website. Say so even if half of these 100,000 physicians who get this you know, five and a half hours of free thing come along and it's a very slick websites, very slick resources, but there is absolutely no animal protein or fat on their dietary plates. If you look at them, they are 100%, they'd be 500% vegan if they could be. There's nothing there showing any animal proteins or fats. So if these, say half of these people then go on to decide they want to join up or they want to right. sit the exams or the windfall for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I believe, could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. Their 24 million donation is nothing compared to what they potentially can get back. And this money will be used to grow the church's medical evangelism and the messaging of the demonization of saturated animal proteins and fats beyond anything we can even conceive at this point in time. It is very, very scary. I've written a lot about the American College of Lifestyle Medicine on my website, if people want to have a look there. And again, it's not that these people are bad. It is a belief, like it is, it, it's their salvation. So this is way beyond a financial conflict of interest in my belief, but I don't believe public policy should be determined by a devout religious belief that's going to affect everybody. And in as we've seen, taking out animal proteins and fats actually harms people. And I think the concern is if you look at the Adventist health studies and you read the fine print in the Adventist health studies, when you say if you're a vegetarian or not, it means you can eat meat once a week. Okay. And the vegan um, clarification is meat less than once a month. So you're not sure. None of their resources show that. So their public messaging is it's devoid of animal proteins and fats. But I believe the people who potentially are well within the Seventh-day Adventist church, are people that eat cold-blooded fish because it's not a warm-blooded flesh and have a little bit of animal protein or fat, just enough to keep their vitamin B levels and the other nutrients that they need. They don't smoke, they don't drink, you know, they don't take drugs, mm. they're in a small community. They've got a lot of very important, I suppose, co-founders that create uh, 
more health than a lot of other basic Americans and basic Australians would consider, uh, you know, healthy. So they've got a lot of things that are going for them with the choices that they make already with their lifestyle choices. Right. Which they call the, right. the healthy user bias in the studies. Yes, absolutely. And, but when you look at that fine print and realize you can actually eat a little bit of meat or a little bit of animal protein or fat within those classifications of vegan and vegetarian that they don't then promote on their resources and certainly not within this American College of Lifestyle Medicine. That's my concern is that there's no transparency. And I guess, you know, when we're chatting earlier, that's what we're talking about as well with the Sunshine Act. Right. I've found a lot of the information in my research because in Australia, we don't have a Sunshine Act. Okay. Nobody actually has to declare their conflicts of interest unless they're on a like an actual board or they get to a review panel or a big committee. But just in basic research, people don't have to. But in America, you've got the Sunshine Act, so at least there's more opportunity to find out. But the NHMRC is the National Health and Medical Research Council here in Australia, and they are the gatekeepers of our dietary guidelines. Okay. And a study in 2016, 2017, found 70% of the guidelines that they have under their umbrella 70% had undisclosed um, conflicts of interest between guideline writers and the pharmaceutical industry. And this is, this is our government's guidelines, you know, right. for, especially for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So we have no hope really when they, they don't even disclose them when they're supposed to on the NHMRC and in the Sunshine Act. And I think a lot of the funding can go through on the side you know, if they fund the university or they right, right. come through a foundation, you know, okay, a foundation is funding this research. And then you say, well, who's funded the, found, you know, where are they getting their money from? But the concern is that the religious ideology and this huge belief that we should be eating fruits, grains, nuts, and seeds, demonizing animal proteins and fats does not have to be declared as a religious belief. There's, there's nothing in there that asks for that. And the influence of the Seventh-day Adventist church to prove, not disprove divine inspiration, I think is a massive conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest in my, in my beliefs. I didn't even know about the Sunshine Act. I know that, you know, in the papers, you'll mm. see they, they have to disclose their affiliations. And so for the people mm. listening and watching that don't know the Sunshine Act, it's that people or doctors or universities have to share where they get their funding. And in 2018, which I shared in my book, the top doctor, he was a uh, neurological surgeon, and he got $29 million in funding from other companies, other pharmaceutical companies. Mm. And so, and then um, one of the top 20 companies made $478 million just in one year of, and we don't know, like you said, if there's other yeah. ways that they're funneling money, mm. you just don't know what is documented. Yeah. And yeah. it gets it's, really it's, scary. Yeah. The transparency is very tricky when you yes. start to get down to the nitty gritty. Well, okay, this foundation's funding it. Well, that sounds great. They've got not, no affiliation that you're aware of, but then where'd they get their money from? Yeah, it's a very complicated system. And I don't know if you can ever have complete transparency, but I do believe we need to start being more transparent about beliefs, not just financial conflicts of interest to right. understand where some of the, the demonization of animal proteins and fats is coming from because... It, it doesn't make any sense unless you look even further. Yeah. A lot of these things that were being pushed during the pandemic, whether it was just the pharmaceutical side and don't even worry about what you're putting yeah. in your mouth during the process, <clears throat> even though there were comorbidities, but I always thought it can't be just about money because these companies are already rich enough. And I mean, I, it makes sense that it's, you know, if it's religious fervor or um, some type of belief system, but what do we do as the person on the, you know, like just me listening to this or watching this, mm -hmm. you know, it seems pretty grim where there's have so much power. And when it's not even just about money, but actually a genuine belief in your system, then it becomes scarier because this person is, or this whole seventh day Adventist it's more than just about money. It's about a belief like this is how I'm going to get to heaven if I get everybody yes. to eat this way. Mm -hmm. So how do we start maybe doing a grassroots movement to realize, hey, you can see in your CGM or your blood glucose meter that when you eat fruits and eat just a plant-based diet, you are going to get sick and you see it mm -hmm. in your ups and downs and even with the fructose. How do we start combating that even within our homes? 
I think it's really important to share this story about Harley, Harvey Wiley, who was the chemist okay. um, and passed the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. He was asked by um, Roosevelt to create this and okay. he fought and fought. Like it took him years to actually even get it passed because of food industry and it was back then it was the meat packers. It was everybody who okay. were putting additives in different things and he struggled and struggled but his biggest nemesis was Coca-Cola. And so despite passing this Pure Food and Drug Act, Coca-Cola blocked him at every level of Congress. So he still couldn't get the cocaine out and the high sugar levels and the caffeine. Like he was really committed to making it a, a safer product. And in 1911, he took Coca-Cola to court okay. and lost. In 1912, he threw up his hands in frustration and he determined that he was never going to get information to the public through policy because right. the players were too powerful. So he went and became the editor of the Good Health magazine. He took his message to the people, which is what you're doing. Right. He took his message to the women, to consumers who were going to be purchasing products to nourish their family. And I believe it was in 1913 or 1914 that he got 20,000 women to march on Congress to demand that Coca-Cola take the cocaine out of their drink. And so I guess what this showed to me was it's about the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, policy can keep changing and doing whatever they want. But if we educate people, if people come to us, come to you and say, how do I nourish my family? You know, what are the conflicts of interest? What's going on here? We have the power to make our own choices and potentially disrupt the paradigm and that's how coca-cola had to take a lot of their cap they didn't take all the cocaine out until about 1928 but they had to reduce it massively because the people demanded it and i think that is the power especially of women who purchase but you know predominantly the food that their families eat so i think that's the exciting thing and also having this incredible group of people around us that also believe the same thing and i think you know, that encouragement. And I think that is the advantage of the Seventh-day Adventist church is that they don't have cheat days because that would look bad in their community. Right. In our community, we're encouraged. You know, why are you giving up sugar? Oh, come on, just have one dessert. You know, it's not going to hurt you to do this. We need to find a community that loves us for who we are, loves us for the choices that we're making. It doesn't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist church, but, you know, that same concept. We don't want to be around people who are just always constantly making us feel like we're doing something that's stupid or, you know, why don't you let your kids have this or, you know, right. find your community and then work together to make yourselves healthy and potentially we then have the ability to change policy because we are consumers and we're demanding a change. No, that's good. I, I think that's how a lot of the whole villainization have fat, of fat has changed. People vote with their dollars in a sense. So you see yes. more, I mean, even in Walmart, which is supposed to be just an average Joe supermarket, they carry mm -hmm. more organic products now. And, yeah. and they carry, um, uh, the other day I saw like an organic, I think full fat yogurt for kids. And I was like, wow, that is a big shift in the <laughs> right direction. They do also serve Oatly's oat milk um, hmm. for children, but you see more of that option. So I, I think you're right. It, it makes so much sense that if we can share, and I think stories are so powerful, right? That's how people, if mm -hmm. I share, I've healed from X, Y, Z because of my diet, then people will be encouraged when they're, when it's not working for them. Yes, I totally agree. And I'm really happy to be here with you, Judy, and have this opportunity because I think the more discussion that we hear around things, but I think understanding the history and I, and I don't know that enough looking back has been done to actually yes. make it, it just makes sense when you look back into history as to why we're doing what we're doing now. You know, I say, who decides what we eat, when we eat and why? Well, it's all written in history. And that's crazy. And it makes so much sense because I really think people are not just motivated by money. I think it's <clears throat> a big factor but when you get religion into it, and I, I have my own faith too, so I get that. And so if these people Absolutely. really believe that you get to heaven by eating a plant-based diet, they're going to do yep. everything they can to get everyone to eat that and get blinders on and not realize, but heart disease is getting worse. Um, there's all these things yeah. that are showing worse. 
but they really want to believe it because they truly believe that's the way to get to heaven. And so I and, get it. And yeah, and it's not even just that they truly believe it, but you know, Ellen G. White taught it was the duty of the church to do public health messaging. It was oh, the duty wow. of the church. Medical evangelism is the right arm of the church and their health reform message is the entering wedge. And they and she taught that by talking about nutrition and diet, then you could get people, you could open hearts and minds to people who wouldn't have thought about their version of the gospel before. Mm. So they take it in as health. They take it in as medicine. You know, this is how they get a lot of people to change their ideas about their diet. And then they try to bring them into the church. I mean, Marianne Thiem, she was the Dutch party for animals in the Netherlands. She came across the Seventh-day Adventist church through their advocacy for a plant-based diet. And she became a devout Seventh-day Adventist and took it into parliament. So, wow. you know, it, it's a very powerful messaging I've seen over and over again, especially in China, that their ability to take health gave them options to evangelize that other religions never had the opportunity to do. Yeah, one yeah. thing I was... I was uh, going to bring up about the pork is um, I've had a few other people on this channel and they talked about how a lot of the, even as much as the, the blue zones aren't real legit science, um, they still shared that in those areas, they all use lard to cook with. Um, I ran into this one website and I'll put it in the show notes, but they shared that Japan and Korea were the top one and two countries that live the longest. And both of them eat a lot of lard and a pork. And yeah. I know I do. I mean, as a Korean American, my parents, I mean, they couldn't afford cows, so they were eating pork and lots of it, and mm -hmm. they still do to this day, and they have decent health. So I think, I mean, if, if we just were to put on a logical hat and then maybe listen to some history, I think we can come yes. to a lot more understanding of why we're sick and why we're eating the things we are. What is the only blue zone that doesn't eat lard? I don't know. Is it the Okinawans? Loma I don't know. Linda. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Loma <laughs> Linda, sense. California which wasn't picked up until 2004, 2005, when Dan Butner, as a journalist, mm. decided that it probably wasn't a great idea that all the blue zones were that far away. And not <laughs> and next to, to the have church. an American one. So he, he said, you can't have a pill for longevity, so let's work out a lifestyle. And he honed in on the Seventh-day Adventist church in Loma Linda. Uh, about a third of their population is Seventh-day Adventist. But I've read a couple of I, I've looked a lot into the blue zones as well and this concept that which we've talked about you know there's no cheat days right, right. in Loma Linda you know and they've got all those other factors that are potentially working towards them but a lot of people move there as a retirement so these are potentially people that may have been very healthy on a an animal-based diet that right. became Seventh-day Adventists and then have moved there to retire or potentially have been Seventh Day Adventist for a long time, but again, it's an area that people have gone to to spend their latter years of their life, or they're there working as Seventh Day Adventists at the University Hospital. That's sure. Massive. Uh, have you seen the size of that hospital? Google no. it. It is so big, and um, so you know it, it's a warped concept because if you look right. at, at a Seventh Day Adventist group potentially in the South Pacific, they are so unwell. And I've been contacted by quite a few people in America whose churches, they said, uh, we've all got diabetes because we all eat the church food. Oh, I'm um, sure. You know, a lot of processed food. But if you look at this whole concept of Blue Zones, did you realize Adventist Health bought the Blue Zones project from Dan Butner in 2020? No, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay, so now you've got the Seventh-day Adventist Church owning 84 hospitals and uh, so many clinics and whatever else. But now they own the Blue Zone Project. And in 2018, one of the cities that wanted to get accreditation as a Blue Zone city in America had to pay something like $6.5 million for that accreditation. And oh you've gosh. got the Adventist Health wanting to run it through 71 communities on the west coast at this point in time and last year at the 89th us congress of mayors i think it was 1400 mayors all signed up for the blue zones so, so let me tell you 
the Adventist health reform message is literally sweeping across the United States of America and embedding itself in the very fabric of your society. And anyway, they own the Blue Zones project and 1,400 mayors not in their area of Advent Health, not the West Coast and in Hawaii. Okay. 1,400 mayors have all signed up at that 89th US Congress of mayors. And to be at that Congress, you had to have a city of 30,000 or more. So the, in, if you look at the things on the Blue Zones project, they've got a plant slant diet. They say 95% plants, of course, no pork, <laughs> no lard. Of course. <laughs> That's not there, I can assure you. They've twisted the messaging and they've made it it's not what it really is in the blue zones, the, the traditional ones right. that were worked out by Giovanni Pess and Michel Pula. They were demographers and they were purely looking at the geographical landscape, you know, the cultural landscape, you know, right. all of those things to work out those areas of longevity. And let's say when Dan Butner decided to do it as part of a National Geographic thing, it was literally how can I work out how to create this longevity into something that Americans are going to <laughs> of course, connect to? <laughs> and it became Loma Linda. So oh, I did not know that Blue Zones was bought out. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I, <laughs> I knew a lot about the church, but I didn't realize, yeah, that, that is very disturbing. You know, there's so much more I can talk to you about. We didn't even get into, um, I'll definitely have to have you on again. For now, I'll put a lot of that information in the show notes. Uh, where can people find you, maybe get in touch with you, uh, a lot more of your work and your writings about a lot of this history? Well, I started the I Support Gary website, so www.isupportgary.com. I started that in 2000 and I think 16 or 2015 to clear Gary's name. So that was the main reason. And I think the medical board had never had anyone create a website to <laughs> support their husband to That's amazing. show how corrupt everything was and, and what was really happening behind the scenes. So I, I'm still there. And I do believe it offered a lot of protection to Gary and I okay. because I've heard of people who've been targeted by industry when they're trying to call out different things. And this was this was just about the truth and a wife protecting her husband and just going, what, what are you doing here? So it's still got I support Gary, but Nina Tyshall said to me, it's very hard to send, to use my work because it, you know, of the name. And my <laughs> godson said to me, Blinda, I'm a doctor, but I'm not going to send someone to I love Gary website as if they're going to take that as serious information. But I do have lots of information on there. And I'm hoping in the next year or so to develop a, a more independent website that okay. just blend effect your research and, and, and it won't keep telling you how, everyone how much I love Gary. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but it, there's really good information on there. I've got a couple of talks on YouTube as well, but I'm on LinkedIn, which is probably a platform that I'm using quite a bit at the moment. I think it's a great spot to connect with professional people. Right. I've got a fantastic tribe on Facebook and it was called Belinda Fick, you know, fructose, but a few people have seen me say, you never talk about sugar anymore. So Gary was the Gary Fick, you know, fructose, not so much me. <laughs> um, I just follow him. I'm not the scientist. I'm the working out the behind the scenes person. So I changed it to Belinda Fecky, low carb, healthy fats. I think that's what I called it. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on a few different things, just Belinda Fecky. I think most people will find me, but the website and probably LinkedIn is the major profile platform I'm using at the moment. Thank you so much Thanks, for this. Jenny. It's very obvious you've done so much research because I know how hard it can be to find research and especially research that people don't want you to find. So it's <laughs> obvious how much effort you put in and thank you because this information is so important to get out there. And I know that there's a lot of questions that even my clients will have of, well, why is saturated fat good for me? And it's, if you understand this history, it explains so much of why we believe what we believe and how it's also flawed. There's not a lot of people that are doing this research. And I really, really am grateful for your work and Dr. Gary Fecky's work as well. Thank you so much, Judy. Well, I think if you look at right back to the beginning of time and you consider evolutionary theory biblical creationism and creation mythology everything is there about why we eat what we eat and when we eat you know it, it's it's all in those three things from the beginning of time no it makes amazing sense. i know there was no cottonseed oil and um... there was no cottonseed oil there was no hydrogenation no <laughs> so, or yeah yeah and even i mean and i think it's how we've treated these things how we've processed them, you know, man's ability to 
be incredibly smart and incredibly lazy at the same time is <laughs> not helped either. Yeah, no, and and also even the way we educate, I think it's just perfect timing of everything. It's a way that we just trust everything that is fed to us. We trust authority and we don't question things. And so I don't even have my kids in the public school system anymore. We moved here okay. just to join the public school system because it's a good rated school. And now I realize if we trust everything that we're given as fact, it may do more harm to us now than do good, it, wh whatever it may be. But I, I want my kids to have like a Socratic thinking where it's why, why do we, why should we believe mm -hmm. that? Why should we do that? I think it's a better option, especially because I believed in it too. I started eating all these big bowl salads and all it did was lead me to an eating disorder and major depression. And it took me to climb out of a very dark hole to learn the truth about animal-based meats, but it took me 12 yeah. years to get there. So, yeah. Well, I think I never went to university. I was educated mm -hmm. as a nurse in the hospital system. So okay. back in the dark ages, we still wore nurses and caps and capes and all those things. So I was never taught how to research. Mm -hmm. So I think that's actually helped me because yeah. Gary was looking at the same sort of things. He was going, you know, why can't I talk about this? And he was researching and he was finding the science. Right. You know, science on fructose, <laughs> science on this. And I just went, this doesn't make sense. Nope, never learned how to research properly up. Oh, this doesn't make, I'm going down here. And I think that's why I've been able to find so many things because right. I've not been taught how to do it. Yes. So I don't find them. Yeah. That's amazing. That's yeah. You know, you're exactly right. And you know what, Dr. Gary is so lucky to have you as his wife and <laughs> so is our community. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay, guys. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. It was very eye opening to realize that a lot of what is pushing the dietary guidelines for veganism or vegetarianism isn't just about money and power, but actually from religious fervor. It's quite scary to think about it in that way. But I think as the more we share about the healings of a meat based diet, the more we can share that a lot of those recommendations are not true. If the higher ups are being funded by these companies that are pro vegan or vegetarian, then it takes a grassroots movement to really help and share the benefits of a meat only or a meat based or a meat focused or a meat heavy way of eating. I hope this conversation provides you another lever to support why eating a heavy meat-based diet is ideal for optimal health. Okay, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys.